Okay, let's turn our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4. And let's read uh, the first three verses. It says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh ceases from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time on, in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, drunkenness, reviries, drunken parties, and abominable idolatries. If you were to go back in time, and we got into a time machine and hit the lever, and you're able to go back in time, where would you go? What would you change in your life, looking back at your old life, looking at the things that you probably were involved in or that you did? Is there an area that you would probably change? Now, God doesn't want us to go back there and dwell there or live there, but sometimes we think about those times. If we would have done this differently, maybe life would have been different, you know? What would you change in your life? We're going to look at that today, this morning, as Peter will be talking about the sufferings of Christ, as we gathered last week, we, we talked about the sufferings of Jesus Christ as his example and his patience, his submissiveness under these, these unjust treatments. In fact, in verse 18 of chapter 3, Peter said, Christ also suffered once for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. And so Peter is encouraging the believers who are suffering for Christ to hang on. Sometimes while we're suffering, we have a tendency of looking at our old life thinking that it was better than the life that we have now in Christ. And Peter is trying to put a stop to that, to the believers at that time, because going to the old life is not better. It's actually worse. And you're abandoning Christ for that old life, which then means that you are jeopardizing your eternal security in Christ. And so Peter exhorts the saints to arm themselves with the same mind that Christ had regarding this unjust punishment that they are going through. And so we're going to talk about having the mind of Christ. Having the mind of Christ. Now, having the mind of Christ under certain situations. Putting on the new and putting off the old as Colossians says through Peter, I mean through Paul. Putting on the mind of Christ when we're suffering. Putting on the mind of Christ when we're going through trials. Putting on the mind of Christ when, when we are experiencing great pressures in life. Putting on the mind of Christ. What kind of my, mind did Christ have? And so Peter's going to talk about putting on the mind of Christ in these last days. So he says in verse 1 as we break this up, Therefore, since Christ suffered... For us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. Now, Christ suffered in the flesh, we will suffer in the flesh. When he says, therefore, he's looking back to chapter 3, verse 18. He also added this, that he might bring us to God, having been made, or having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Through the sufferings of Christ, we have been brought closer to God, because the door has been opened because of the work of Jesus Christ, so now we have access to God. And thus, if our bodies die like Christ's body died, though he will live spiritually in the presence of the Lord. So that therefore looks back to this unjust suffering that the believers were enduring, this undeserving death that they were experiencing. Peter is exhorting them to arm themselves Arm themselves. Get ready for this because it's coming. I want to look at that phrase, arm yourselves. In fact, highlight it or underlight it in your Bibles. It's okay to write in your Bibles. Um, sometimes people ask me, can I write in my Bible? I mean, it's a holy book. You know, will I desecrate it? And no, you won't desecrate it. It's just a book. 
but it has holy words in there. And so if you want to clarify the Bible, then write little words next to the words that are there to help you understand the Bible so that when others ask you questions, you can go there and you go, oh, okay, that's what that word means there. And now you have better clarification to share it with them. So there's nothing wrong with writing in your Bible or highlighting with different highlight colors. So he says, arm yourself. The, the Greek word for arm there is hoplizo, and it comes from the word hoplin, which means weapon. And it's literally talking about a weapon. And basically, it means that you need to prepare yourself. In fact, the focus is upon the process of equipping yourselves. The word was used in the Greek to mean to arm yourselves with a weapon, provide yourself some sort of defense in, this, in life itself. In the case of a soldier... It was important that you knew your equipment so that you could protect yourself with that weapon. This verb was also used in the Greeks as a soldier who prepared himself for the coming battles as with armor as he was preparing himself. Today we deal a lot with that because of the attacks on our constitution here in America. They are trying to remove our constitutional right to bear arms. The Second Amendment. And so we're being attacked more than ever before here in America. There's threats of going door to door and coming in and removing any weapons that you may have in your home. Now, because of this attack, the rise in sales of arms are increasing. The rise in sales of bullets are increasing. Of course, the cost is increasing, too, because they're trying to stop you from purchasing uh, bullets. You know, and then so what happens is, is that people then are making their own, uh, repairing their own and so forth. And that's happening across the nation here. People are equipping themselves with these weapons. Not only are they purchasing them and putting them under their pillow or in a safe place. Uh, the law requires that you, you, you put your gun either under a lock and key in a vault of some sort or you, you separate the ammunition from the gun and have them in two different places. That's what the law requires in order for you to have a weapon. Now, people are purchasing these weapons and they are preparing themselves to protect themselves, not just from criminals, but also from government. And we're hearing more about that today, the fact that government will come in and take your weapons now because they want to disarm you for whatever reason. And we know this will take place in the end times. They're, they want to arm, disarm us so that they can control us. Now, I have never been one for weapons because of my wife. Uh, I've always wanted to purchase a weapon, but my wife has always been scared of guns. And so we really never purchased a weapon. In fact, to this day, we still have not purchased a weapon. We've shot guns, but we've never purchased uh, any weapon. And, and, and so it wasn't a big deal for us in the past. But lately, we've been thinking more about it than ever before because of what's going on in our world. And so our sons have been motivating us to, to purchase weapons, and, and we've actually gone out and shot weapons. Now, Virginia was totally against them. and In fact, if we had toy guns around the house, they'd disappear because she just did not like toy guns and the kids shooting at each other. You know, they get their fingers in and go pow, 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 you know, that type of thing and fall down and play dead, you know, and so forth. I mean, that's as close as to a gun that we got. But because of what's going on, we went with our sons to a range and Virginia and I shot some gl Glocks, I would say Glucks, Glocks, you know, and 45 West Smith, Smith and Weston. And see, I don't even know about them, you know. And so we, we shot them at these, you know, bullseye sights and stuff, targets. And she was pretty good. She was shooting 45, and she was hitting the bullseye of the target, like Charlie's Angels, you know, just boom, boom. We didn't even know how to hold it. I I'm holding the gun, and I'm like, so how do you do this? And they're like... Falling to the ground, you know, because I'm pointing it everywhere. You know, first thing is, Dad, take your finger out of the trigger. You know, put it on the side. I'm like, oh, okay, got to do that because you're not supposed to put it in there in case something happens, you know. So we had to learn how to shoot the gun, how to hold the gun, you know, and so forth. And we were equipping ourselves. It would be interesting if you purchase a gun, you put it under your pillow, and probably if a criminal came in, I went to reach for the gun, I probably would have had the safety on and not know how to even push the button. And I'd probably push the button, the clip would fall out, you know, because there's two buttons, I didn't even know that. One, one for the safety and one for the clip itself. And if you hit that clip, when the clip just falls right out, and then you got a gun without bullets, maybe one in the chamber, I guess, 
You know, so I didn't even know that. So what Peter is saying here, like a soldier who's preparing himself for battle, for protection, whatever, you have to prepare yourself spiritually. And so you go out to the range and you practice. You equip yourself. You get to know your gun. You clean your gun. You work with it, whether a shotgun or whether a, a handgun or whether a machine gun, you know, whatever it is, a bazooka if you have one. You got to know it. So spiritually, we need to arm ourselves with spiritual things so that when we battle the flesh, when we battle the enemy, when we battle the culture today, that we can arm ourselves against it so that we can stand and win against it. Because uh, Paul said what in Ephesians? That we don't fight against powers and principalities of this air, flesh and blood, right? But against the spiritual realm, against demonic forces, against those things that are against Christ. And so we can't battle physically. We battle spiritually. And so Jesus calls us to a radical living, doesn't he? People often ask me, do we have a right to even use a gun? I mean, can we take a life? Was Christ against taking a life? He came to die for life. Why would he take life? Well, Jesus said that there's going to come a time when you pick up the sword and you defend yourself. Is this the time? It could possibly be. And if it is, you know, then we need to equip ourselves to defend ourselves. But Jesus also talked spiritually that we need to arm ourselves. You remember in the Gospels, Matthew chapter 5, 29 through 30, he talked about sin. And if you're struggling with sin, and if that sin is destroying you, and its, its whole purpose is to kill you, eventually it leads to death. But if you're struggling with it, Jesus said, you know, if your eye is causing you to sin, take it, pluck it out, and cast it away. If your right hand is causing you to sin, cut it off. It's better to do that than to enter into um, heaven. without. Uh, it's better to enter into heaven without a hand than to hell with a hand. And so he's radically teaching us that whatever it takes to battle, to arm ourselves, we need to do so. It's radical living. And Peter here, obviously, has learned how to arm himself for battle. Peter was an interesting guy. Uh, he was a fisherman. He had a nice life, a good business, yeah? lived on the lake, could fish all day long and make some money at it. It, it was comfortable. And then Jesus comes and changes his whole life. He calls him, and he becomes a disciple of Jesus Christ. And as a disciple, he then began to learn and to suffer through things. He was tempted and challenged in life. Uh, there were situations that he was put in and that he literally denied the Lord because he wasn't equipped yet. And it wasn't until the upper room experience where the Holy Spirit came upon him that all of a sudden he was equipped. He was ready for battle. That he went out and he was able to preach the gospel to thousands and thousands were saved because of that equipping. So Peter understands uh, what it is to be equipped, to arm yourselves for battle. Uh, there was a time where he was even arrested after the anointing of the Holy Spirit. They took him, they put him in jail. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 12 that Peter just literally fell asleep. He just fell asleep. He was in total peace. He knew that God was in control of his life. And so he fell asleep and then the Lord opened up the gates and he was able to get out of prison through the Lord's power. Don't miss Peter's point here. <clears throat> We're all involved in a spiritual battle. And whether you like it or not, if you are a believer, you're in a war. You're in a war with the flesh you're in a war with the devil, and you are in a war with yourself. The flesh we have with us always. And there's a battle with our flesh because our flesh desires things. And sometimes those things are not always good for us. And we're in a battle with the enemy because the enemy hates us. He hates the fact that we are being productive and fruitful, and he wants to stop that. And so he will do whatever he can do to stop us from being fruitful. And so we have to battle against him. And then we have a battle against ourselves, our own minds. Are we doing the right thing? Are we not doing the right thing? Should I go this way? Should I go that way? What am I doing? No, I'm messed up. Oh, no, I don't know what I'm thinking. You know, we battle with ourselves. How do we defend ourselves of these things? If you don't arm yourselves, if you don't prepare yourselves, then you become a casualty. You become a casualty and you're put on the sidelines and you're ineffective. And that's not what God wants. Peter is commanding the reader to adopt an attitude of Christ, to be equipped. Understand that we will suffer. 
and understand that we can have faith in God and He will deliver us from those sufferings as we're going through them. So we're to arm ourselves with the same mind as Christ, the same attitude as Christ. Paul put it this way in Philippians 2, 1, Therefore, if any... If there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affliction or mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus told us in the gospel, Matthew 16, 24, that if you follow him, you have to pick up his cross, your cross, and follow after him, whatever that cross is. And so putting on Christ, having the mind of Christ, living like Christ, every time we resist temptation, we become more equipped to resist temptation. Every time we suffer, we're more equipped to resist the suffering that comes at us again. I noticed that about my walk. In the beginning, when I first suffered, it was really difficult. It's like, wait a minute, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. Why am I suffering now? I thought everything was going to be okay, that, that everything was going to be peaceful, that we were going to have a joyful time. Why am I suffering? This doesn't make any sense. And I realized that there was more suffering to come, and God was equipping me to battle that suffering. There's always suffering to come. There's always trials and temptations. But the more that we resist it, the more that we're equipped against it, then we are able to battle it when it becomes fierce. And in these last days, it will become fierce. So if we're to arm ourselves and put on the mind of Christ, Peter goes on and says in the next statement, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now what is he talking about there? Is Peter saying that we no longer sin because we are suffering? Well, we know the Bible doesn't teach that. We know the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We know the Bible says that we will continue to sin until we get to heaven and become perfect. So he's not talking about that. What he is talking about is the fact that as we battle against these things, that we begin to sin less. We cease from sinning more. And I thought about that for a second. I started looking at the Old Testament when I first got saved. And I was looking at the Ten Commandments, and I can remember before being a Christian that I didn't follow any of the Ten Commandments. Some people say, well, I live by the golden rule, the Ten Commandments. Really? Have you followed them? And you start listing them, and, and they have to admit, no, I haven't followed them at all. In fact, I don't even know them. You know, I know do not commit adultery, do not murder, you know, do not uh, steal. You know, I haven't done any of those, really? You know, the first one is love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Have you really done that? You know, I can think back, and I didn't even think about God. wasn't concerned about God. didn't want God in my life. And so, no, I broke that commandment. But I notice now that I want to live for God. I love God more, and I want to love Him even more. So I am sinning less. You know, keeping the, the Sabbath holy in the past, I never would have gone to church. You know, people come to church for various reasons. They want something. You know, it, it, it's, it's a danger. You know, we have a food ministry here. And people come on the first and the third. Why? They want food. But they don't want God. So they're really they're not keeping the Sabbath because they're not here every Sunday. And we're hoping that through giving them food and loving them, you know, and meeting their needs, that they're going to say, I need to come and serve God. I need to come and worship God and not food, not resources. You know, that's the purpose of it. But they come for the wrong reasons. But, you know, when this stuff is brought to their attention, they have a choice. They have a choice. And we have people here now that have come for food and now they're staying here. And they've been here and now they're serving here. And that's how it works because they encounter God. And so they keep the Sabbath. I could remember I didn't go to church. My wife went to Catholic church. I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go because they wanted money and I didn't want to give them money. And I felt they were hypocrites, you know, so I never went to church. You know, I stayed home. But now that I'm a believer and I understand that the Bible says not to forsake the gathering of one another, and so now I come to church on Sundays. Not because I have to teach, by the way, you know, but because I want to be in church. Not just on Sundays, but Wednesdays and on Saturday nights and on Mondays. And whenever those doors are open, I love being here. I find I sin less. 
I find I used to steal, but I'm finding that I steal less. In fact, I find myself returning money. You know, I, I've gone to restaurants like uh, Chipotle's. I love Chipotle's. And sometimes I'll get double chicken, which costs you two fifty more or somewhere around there. And I notice they didn't charge me for it, and I didn't catch it till the end. So when I come back, I tell them, oh, I owe you two fifty. dollars like, for what? Well, you gave me double chicken, and you didn't charge me for it. They're, they look at me strange, like, why would you give us our money? What's wrong with you? Because I don't want to steal, and I, I'm aware of it, and I want to give it back. And usually they just charge me double chicken when I just order one scoop of chicken. You, know? and you find yourself doing that. You find money, you want to give it back to the owner. You don't keep it, you know, unless you steal your wife's money. And she doesn't know about it. So we sin less, right? We sin less, coveting our neighbor's goods. You know, you don't cover, covet them as much as you used to. And so you're sinning less. Why? Because God is working in your life. See, Peter isn't saying that we are to be sinless. He's saying that we are to sin less as believers. And we find ourselves sinning less. Why? Because we're going through the sufferings. We're going through the growth pains as believers. Being a Christian is difficult, guys. It's difficult. It really is. You know, it's easy to come to the Lord by grace, through faith. He has prepared the way, and we simply have to agree with him that Jesus was enough and give our lives to him. But then it's the walking. It's, it's the neglecting the old life. It's changing, and it's saying, I want to be new. I want to be different in this world. That's the hard part. Taking on what we think are rules when they are godly characters that take place. And we're going to touch on some of these things that, that are going to offend some of you. And you'll be challenged with it, as I was, because I lived that life. <clears throat> but it means radical living for Christ, to be righteous and set apart for the will of the Lord. So Peter goes on in verse 2 that we are to live out the will of the Lord, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh. Now he's speaking to the believers, that the believers are no longer to live out the rest of their time here on this earth in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. The word the lust there is in the plural. You notice that with the S. It means passions and evil cravings. As believers, we are not to live out the rest of our life. Now that we've been saved, the rest of our life, we're not to live it in the flesh. We're not to desire and have a passion for evil things. We now should desire good things, righteousness, justness, you know, and those things of God, not the evil things. Let me share it with you in the Amplified Translation. So that he can no longer spend the rest of his natural life living by his human appetites, and desires, but he lives for what God's will. He lives for God's will. What is God's will? That's a good question. We are to live for God the rest of our life. What's the rest of our life? What's the rest of our life? Well, I don't know. Only God knows that. Only God gives us a timetable. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You might know when your time is up. Now, some of us here have cancer. You know, and we feel that our time might be up soon. Um, what's the difference between you and me where I don't have cancer? Really nothing, only that you know I don't know. I could walk out that street and car could hit me and that's the end of me. A friend of mine uh, posted that uh, a friend of theirs was on the 10 freeway. And they uh, either were cut off or they cut someone off and the person got mad. And as they got closer to each other, the guy pulls a gun out and starts shooting at him. Just right there on the freeway. Went right through the windshield, shot a couple other parts of the car, and he was spared by the grace of God. But you don't know when your life would be taken just like that. We don't know. We really don't know. So the rest of your life, it means the rest of your life, whatever you have. And we don't know what it is, so that's why we have to be consistent in living as we have it now. In other words, don't waste it. Don't waste it on foolish and ungodly things. Invest it in the will of the Lord. Invest it in godly things. Be busy about your Father's work in heaven. As Jesus said at, a, at a, the age of 12, that I must do my Father's work. He understood that. He knew what he meant. Because we are to live for the will 
of God. Well, what's the will of God? Look up in your Bibles the will of God, and you'll find a lot of places where it talks about what the will of God is for your life. If you don't know what the will of God for your life is, then I encourage you to start at the basics. And that is be in church on a regular basis, pray on a regular basis, read your Bible on a regular basis, and then wait on the Lord to direct you. Have a desire to be directed by God, have a desire to know the will of God, and then he will lead you. As I shared, uh, and I don't think the person would mind, he came in here for some food because they were having a hard time, and he found this church, and we gave him the food, and he came back the following Sunday. Then he's been here every, every, every Sunday since. And then he gets saved. He gives his life for the, to the Lord. And, and now he wants to serve the Lord, and now he's serving the Lord. And so he's learned the will of the Lord for his life in that manner. That's how the Lord ministers to you. He ministers in a divine, natural way in your life because he wants to direct you. Some of you are involved in worship. Some of you are involved in other parts of the ministry. We need helps in various ministry, the parking lot ministry, the ushers. These are ways to learn and know the will of the Lord for your life. God wants you to know. Now, we do know, as Paul said, that in Ephesians 5.17, he says, Don't be unwise, but understand the will of the Lord. So, as Christians, we need to understand the will of the Lord for our lives. We need to have a desire to understand that. Now, as part of suffering, what is the will of the Lord? That we endure it. In fact, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. So if you're suffering, and it is the will of God that you are suffering, then in that suffering, give thanks unto the Lord. That's a good attitude to have. See, the old attitude in the world was is get mad, get upset, complain throw a little pity party you know and say this isn't fair life isn't fair but God is saying now this is my will that when you're suffering rejoice say thank you Lord because you suffered now I get to partake of your sufferings I get to experience the things you experienced I get to feel the things you felt when you were suffering in this life and so you get that great privilege of experiencing those things while suffering also, Peter talks about the will of the Lord several times, at least three times. <clears throat> in chapter 2, he said, for this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. So the will of the Lord is to do good, so that no one can speak bad about you. If you're doing good, they may speak bad about you, but it's not true. Because you're doing good. You're righteous in the works that you are performing. In fact, in chapter 3, verse 17, he says, For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good. So that's the will of the Lord. Do good and suffer for it. So these are the things that are the will of God in your life. And there are many more. And we could exhaust that, but I'm not going to exhaust that, nor am I going to talk about it any longer. So let's move on. But know the will of the Lord for your life. The Lord wants you saved. If you don't know Jesus Christ personally, he wants to have a personal relationship with you. He really does. And then he wants to minister to you. And and then he wants to lead you and guide you in this world. And so start there first and watch what God does. Now, in addition, look at verse 3. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of Gentiles. Now remember, Peter's talking to these believers, Gentiles, possibly Jews also, more likely Jews living among the Gentiles. And he's saying, we have spent enough of our past lifetime living or doing the will of the Gentiles. He's saying, we've lived long enough without God. The Gentiles lived without God. They were considered ungodly. They were considered barbaric. They had no passion or love for God. They had passion and love for the flesh for enjoyment of life and culture. If you lived as a Gentile, you were considered a heathen. You were considered selfish and full of idolatrous acts. Now, I lived 26 years without the Lord. 26 years of not caring about the Lord and what His will is for my life. I lived the passions that Peter is going to list here in this world. At a young age, I lived those passions. I can remember at the age of eight, living out those passions. 
in this world. At the age of 16 and 18, already drinking and living out those passions of this culture and this world. And then even after that, Virginia and I, we used to love to party. And in the 80s, it was really big in the culture to go out dancing. It was a big thing. And so we would go out to places like Black Angus. At that time, these restaurants actually had dance floors and the bars open. Black Angus, Red Onion, um, what are the other ones? Uh, yeah, all those ones. Bobby McGee's, right, that one there. And you could go there and have a nice dinner and then get a table by the dance floor, have some drinks, and then dance away. And we would do that every Tuesday night. Her mom would watch the kids because we already had about, uh, you know, three, four kids already at that time. And we would go out every Tuesday night. And we'd meet our old high school friends there, you know, and, and we'd all party. And I'd get drunk. Virginia really didn't care about drinking too much um, at all, actually. She wasn't a drinker, you know, but she went out because of me. And so we had a great time, you know, just heating up the floor, doing the Michael Jackson, the moonwalk, all of that stuff, you know. You didn't know that about me, but I mean, I was a sinful person, and I, and I loved to dance. I, I loved to dance, and I loved to get out there and dance, and we've seen all kinds of stuff because of that. Uh, you know, there's big ushers. I mean, they had big ushers there, bouncers, you know, that get you by the collar and throw you out, you know, because you got drunk, and you're making a fool of yourself, and a lot of guys made fools of themselves during those times. I learned, though, that that life wasn't fulfilling. And I didn't want that life. In fact, once I became a Christian, I gave up that life and I never did it again. And dancing was not even a part of my agenda again. Whenever we, we went to a place and, and they said, well, let's go dance. And I'm like, no, no I'm not going to dance. I'm not going to get involved in that. I was there. I'm not going to do that again. And it was a struggle for me. And I'll let you in on a little secret. I learned God's grace and his liberties. And after a while, uh, because we had our anniversaries and birthday parties that we would throw you know, and people would bring music and they wanted to dance. And so then I just kind of let up a little bit and I would dance, you know, and just the wholesome, nice stuff. It wasn't what we used to do. It wasn't that we got drunk. We just enjoyed the dance part of it, you know, in that occasion. And so I would bust my Elvis Presley knee jerking move, you know, on people. And they're like, wow, where do you learn how to dance like that? Well, old life, old life. You know, don't do it all the time. It does feel weird, you know, because you've given that up. But, you know. That stuff is old. That's, that stuff was you before and you involved in that. Peter's implication is that, that we are believers now and that we have experienced that world, but we should no longer go back to that world again at all because it will only lead to destruction. So the word past implies closed. It implies closed in the Greek. It's mean it means that's a closed case. It's closed. It's no longer a part of your life anymore and you shouldn't be a part of it. Now he lists these works of the flesh here. And so I'm going to list these works of the flesh and we're going to define them rather quickly here. But I want you to understand something. Peter and that culture at that time were dealing with the same things we deal with today, which is amazing when you think about it. They dealt with drunkenness. They dealt with uh, drinking parties. They dealt with carousing. They dealt with silly living. They dealt with all that stuff, just like we deal with it today. And so I want to make that point. And then also the Jewish people recognized that the Gentiles, uh, they were wicked, pagan idolaters. They had no love for God whatsoever. And they understood that they were into this idolatry and way of living. The Gentiles would literally, they would have their worship services, but they were evil worship services where they would participate in drunken orgies and prostitution and various things like that. They were barbaric, and the Jews recognized that. And Peter is dealing with some of those issues just like we are dealing with some of them today. And so he lists, he lists, the sins of the flesh here for us. Now, before I get into it, I want you to know that Paul also listed them. He listed them twice, and John also listed them in the book of Revelation. And so it's important that we understand this. If you are offended, then good. I hope that you're offended enough to change and to stop living that way. 
because you're headed down the wrong track and you're headed towards damnation. How can you say that? Well, let's let the Bible say it. Listen to what Paul said in Romans chapter 13, 13. Let us walk properly. So how do we walk properly? As in the day, not in revilery, in drunkenness, not in lewdness, not in lust, not in strife, or not in envy. So he lists those works of the flesh. We are not to walk that way, but to walk properly. In Galatians 5.21, the the works of the flesh, he says, envy, murder, drunkenness, revileries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you're practicing these things, you're not going to heaven. That's what the Bible teaches. And I hope you're scared. And I hope you'll change. If you are involved in these things and you are practicing them in your life. There was a great evangelist named Billy Sunday. He had a great ministry to the lost. And they had asked him, what's the secret of your ministry? And this is what he said, I always preach on sin and I am very specific. Like, wow. 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 Today, if we preach on sin, we get in trouble. You listen to Joel Olstein, he won't talk about sin. He'll talk about prosperity. You know, he'll talk about how you can put your next step forward and be prosperous in it, but he won't talk about your sin because that will offend you. Homosexuality, oh, we don't want to talk about that. You know? We don't want to talk about the result of sin and hell and those things. In fact, we don't believe that there is a hell, you know, and they don't talk about those things. Billy Sunday said, I'm specific about sin. Now, why is that? Because I think that if you can get to a man or a woman's heart and reveal their sinfulness and their need for a Savior, that they would be willing to repent. God is trying to bring them to a point where they have a choice, either to continue to practice their sin or to give it up and live for Christ and watch what God does for their lives. Many a man who have come out of that type of life to do great works for the Lord once they're sobered up, once they're not living that way, once they stop practicing those things. God can use them in a great way because it's a great salvation for someone to come from a life like that to a life of holiness and separation to God. Here, Peter spells it out just like Billy Sunday. He's very clear. And so he lists the works of the flesh. He says, when we walk in lewdness, We're not to walk in lewdness. If we're practicing lewdness, then we will not enter the kingdom of God. Well, what is lewdness? It's interesting when you define these words. You know, I can just pass this up, and a lot of commentaries pass these things up because it's it's difficult for them to deal with them. McGee said finally after so many years, he finally said, okay, I'm going to write about these sins because I've been passing them over. Because when you get into it, it's pretty bad. The word lewdness in in the Greek is sensuality. Sensuality. It it originally refers to any excess or lack of restraint. A person who has no control over his passions. But it's come to convey the idea of shameless excess. And the absence of restraint, especially with sexual excess. You have no sexual restraints whatsoever. Ever. Do we see that in our world today? <clears throat> we sure do. <clears throat> they flaunt it before us at times. In fact, Peter uses <clears throat> the word in, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, and he describes the word as filthy. It's filthiness. The idea behind the word is that of a shameless conduct with the emphasis on sensuality, and it's a behavior that is to shock the world. I want to shock you with my sensuality. And we see that in the world today. You go to a university campus and you go to one of their parties and you're shocked at what these kids are doing. You you go to a gay pride parade, you will be shocked at what they flaunt before your eyes. The news media won't even put it out on the TV because they know how shocking it is. Go to YouTube, look it up. And you'll see how shocking it is. Uh, I was reading an article, and it was talking about women who felt oppressed 
And so they want to be liberated. And so they had a parade where they all went topless through town. That's shocking. That's sensuality. That's lewdness. And that is what Peter is talking about here. This is his time. That was his time. And we see it happening today. And then he said, lust. Lust. Now the word lust there is a strong, irregular appetite. And it includes all kinds of desires. It's not necessarily sexual, but it's any kind of lust. But it's really extreme. The Greek word is not limited to the sexual desires, but it's not unrestricted of passions. And so any types of passions and lust that are ungodly is a work of the flesh. Drunkenness. Drunkenness. Now here's a big one. Drunkenness. Because we deal with it in our society today. Alcoholism is, is a big issue in our world today. In fact, um, we don't want to hear that it's a sin. We want to hear it's a disease and that it's not our fault. But in reality, the Bible says it's a sin and it is your fault for being a drunkard. The word drunkenness means bubbling up or overflowing. People who drink and get drunk, they're the, they're the life of the party. They're the fun ones. Everybody likes them because they're just bubbly. But they're drunk. They're drunk. I know this because, not that I was a alcoholic, but I got drunk. And I notice how it, in, it, it takes over your whole mentality. You can go to a party, very shy, very quiet, and I am. But as soon as you start drinking, you start talking. Next thing you know, people are laughing. And now you've got this crowd like, wow, I'm pretty good here. And you're bubbling all over the place. God says that's a sin. And that you're in bondage to your strong drink. And Peter says it back then as we say it today. And then rovaries, rovery, rivalries, carousing, cosmo in the Greek. Originally, this was an, an, an interesting uh, word because originally it wasn't a bad thing. Uh, whenever you went out to war or you had victory over something and you threw a big party, everybody would gather together and they all be, you know, rejoicing and shouting and, and walking around saying, wow, we're victories. You know, we're victors over this great nation that oppressed us and now we're free, you know, and so it was a good thing. But then it turned into a bad thing where they began to do it at their parties and they were getting drunk and they were doing stupid things and, and, and things that shocked the world uh, at that time. Um, there are stories of, of guys taking torches in the middle of the night and burning things, and, and playing music to deities, and singing and playing, and uh, from house to house, uh, male and females, uh, doing public disturbances, and so forth. Go to a Super Bowl game, and just wait till afterwards, and you see the same thing. Guys with torches burning cars, and turning them over, you know, and jumping up and down on vehicles with their beers, and their alcohol, and doing public displays of indecency, and things like that. Same thing. Same thing that happens back then as it does tonight. Shouldn't be. <clears throat> now this was an interesting one. The next one is drinking parties. <clears throat> I thought drinking parties, doesn't that include drunkenness? Not really. This Greek word, drinking parties, is talking about contests that involve drinking. I thought, wow, that is so interesting. They had contests back then that involved drinking, just like we do today. You know, you, you see it all over the news in these colleges and these campuses, or you go out to Mexico. We had gone to Mexico and um, for vacation, and it happened to be at the tail end of spring break. And so when you went in the middle of the afternoon, uh, early evening to go to dinner, you'd see all the college kids in the bars, and they were drinking, and they were having their little games. You know, their, their big old thing of beer, throwing a shot of whiskey, I'm down it, you know, and see who could do that having their containers with the tube and pouring it down someone's face, you know, doing that. Or a little quarter game with little shot glasses, you know, they were doing all that. It's crazy. I understand it because I used to live that life, used to be involved in that, and it seemed to be fun at the time. But Peter says that it is a work of the flesh to be involved in those things. And he ends with abominable idolatries. And this is speaking of the Gentiles and their worship of idols. The word abomination means unlawful. 
it is unlawful. All these things are unlawful to God. And you can't have a relationship with God if you are involved in these things. Let me say this. This type of life can never satisfy you. It can never satisfy you. Drinking can never satisfy because you want the next drink and then the next drink and now it shackles you. And now you can't quit. You know, my father was an alcoholic. And I used to go drinking with him. And he'd always say, I can quit. I can quit. Okay, Dad, quit then. I will next week. And it was always next week and next week. And he ended up dying because of his alcoholism. He gave him a heart attack. See, it will only shackle you and kill you. Any of these sins, any of these appetites, as believers, these things might seem enticing. Don't fall for it because it's a trap of the devil and he will only destroy you in them because they will never satisfy you. The only thing that satisfies is Christ. Christ satisfies. Wait a minute. What about the religious, holy moly? When, how can that satisfy you? It does. When you have your heart filled with Christ, there's no desire for those things. Your desire is for your wife. Your desire is for life. Your desire is for the work of the Lord. It's for the things of God. Because you see men and women's lives changing for the better. And that's a beautiful thing to see that stuff happen. And only Christ can give you the peace that you need to be satisfied. Because it's once and for all when he fills you. In fact, I'll go out to say that anyone who is involved in these work of the flesh are looking for Christ. Because they're looking to fill themselves with a peace and they can't find it. Not in those things. And only until they come to Christ will they find it. So Peter says, we have spent enough of our past life doing the will of the Gentiles. Stop it. We need to start serving the Lord. I want to encourage some of you. If you're involved in these things, you need to repent. You need to stop today. And you need to give your life to the Lord. Those that are believers, don't go down that road. Get rid of that temptation. Whatever it is that you're doing, whatever it is you're playing with, stop it. Give it to the Lord and get busy with the kingdom of God. Christians who have been born again are new creatures in Christ Jesus. They're now in control of their passions and their desires. They're now the Lord's property and for the Lord's will to be done in their lives. It's what God wants. And so don't go down that path. 